If you've just seen the previous chapter on debt, then you might be wondering if either our savings or our assets are of sufficient quantity to make those levels of debt perfectly manageable. In the next chapter, I'll deal with assets. In this chapter, I will present evidence that the United States has failed to save money at virtually every level of society and make the claim that the United States government is insolvent. I use that term precisely. Whereas bankruptcy is a legal process that begins once cash flows can no longer meet current obligations, insolvency happens when one's liabilities exceed one's assets and is the first step on the road towards bankruptcy. The purpose of the crash course is to give you the context and the data you need to be able to accurately assess the likelihoods and risks that our economy faces over the next few years. My position is that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. And to support this statement, I'm going to take you through six key areas of data. Debt, savings, assets, demographics, peak oil, and climate change. Any one of these could prove economically challenging, but the combination of two or more simultaneously, well, I'll leave that for you to assess. This is a chart of the personal savings rate stretching back to 1959. The personal savings rate is the difference between income and expenditures for all U.S. citizens, expressed as a percentage. So a number like 10% indicates that for every dollar earned, 10 cents was saved, not spent. Note that the long-term historical average for U.S. citizens between 1959 and 1985 was 9.2%. For comparison, in Europe, that number is around 10%, and in China, a stunning 30% of income is saved. Savings are important to us individually because they form the cash cushion that gets us through economic difficulties, and at the national level because savings are essential to the formation of investment capital, that is, the property, plant, and equipment that create actual future wealth. You may have read or heard recently that the personal savings rate has plunged to historic lows last associated with the Great Depression. In fact, the personal savings rate has steadily declined from 1985 to present, indicating that those headlines we just saw were not some very recent blip on the radar, but rather the culmination of a 23-year erosion of savings as a cultural attribute of U.S. citizens. However, we are not a nation of averages, and this chart somewhat obscures the fact that the extremely wealthy are saving incredible amounts of money, while at the lower ends, the savings rate is deeply negative. Why is that important? Because as the Greek philosopher Plutarch once stated, an imbalance between the rich and the poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. What else can we note about this chart? For starters, a persistently declining savings rate tells us that there is an implicit assumption by the majority that credit will be available in the future. As we look at this chart, we might also note that the savings rate began its decline right around 1985. Hmm, wait a minute. Didn't we see that same time frame in the last section on debt? Why, yes, yes we did. While this chart is showing all debt across all sectors, and the prior chart was of personal savings only, we can note that our national tolerance of debt shifted drastically upwards beginning in 1985, right as our national approach to savings was beginning its long decline towards zero. In order to believe that the future is going to be bigger, shinier, and brighter than the present, you have to believe that low savings and high debts are a path to prosperity. I am skeptical, to say the least, because this just doesn't make sense to me. It violates several laws of nature. Another category of savings is pensions and retirement funds. At the state and municipal levels, we can observe that they, too, have failed to save. And state and municipal pensions are underfunded to the tune of $1 trillion. What this means is that as money was taken in from taxes, states and municipalities actively chose to spend that money elsewhere, in preference to putting it into pension funds. The idea there, we can guess, was to spend money today and let someone else figure out how to pay for it in the future. Well, for many states, the future has finally arrived. What does it mean when we say that the state and municipal pensions are underfunded by a trillion dollars? How is that calculated? The trillion dollar shortfall is what is called a net present value, or NPV, amount. A net present value calculation adds up 
all the cash inflows, in this hypothetical example, $1,000 per year for six years, and offsets those cash flows, or nets them, against all future cash outflows. Since a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future, however, the future cash flows have to be discounted and brought back to the present. We net all the cash inflows and costs, we discount them back to the present to determine if the thing we are measuring has a positive or negative value. Net. Present. Value. This is the methodology used to calculate the status of state and municipal pension funds. Growth in the value of the pension fund assets, plus future taxes, are offset against cash outlays to pensioners and brought back to the present to indicate that in order for the pension funds to simply have a zero value, one trillion dollars would, today, have to be placed into those funds. An important realization about NPV calculations is that the future has already been largely taken into account, so waiting and hoping for a different future result to emerge pretty much never works. If we have to place a trillion dollars in the funds today, but don't do this, next year the number will only be larger. The only way it could be smaller is if fewer people are collecting benefits or the fund's assets outperform the assumed rate of growth that fed the NPV calculation. Moving right along, corporations are coming off the highest levels of profitability in decades, but they too opted to underfund their pensions to the tune of 1.5 trillion net present value dollars in preference for, uh, other uses for that cash. Because pensions typically invest in bonds and stocks, in a roughly 60-40 split, any recessions or market declines will only add to the shortfall. In part, the pension shortfalls are a direct function of the extremely low interest rates currently available. Thanks, Greenspan and Bernanke! And also because the main stock market index is pretty much at the same level it was nine years ago. And that's only if we don't inflation adjust the results. If we did, we'd have to go back a bit further. Since most pension funds assume an 8 to 10% yearly return, and since the stock market has had a zero gain for nine years, the pension shortfalls are perfectly understandable. But when we get to the federal government, that's when the scary numbers emerge.